Here's an example of, uh, of some experiments that Andrew did on typical class H well cement in a flow-through uh, system that was exposed uh, to, for 28 days to uh, carbonated brine. And you see this sequence of reaction rings coming into the cement, into this uh, cylindrical sample. At this point, the outer layer of this reacted zone has essentially lost its structural integrity. You just flake the, the stuff off. Okay, it doesn't look like, uh, like uh, hydrated cement at all. So this, for a while, was quite a concern of ours. Um, at the moment, it's not quite such a concern. I'll be happy to discuss more details if anyone is interested. But uh, let's leave it there for now, because I'd like to ask a very simple question, which is that if I have this kind of a system, uh, how should I think about doing some kind of analysis or doing a model of the system? You know, I'm, I'm going to need a fairly large domain, because I need to put away a lot of CO2. So I might need 1,000 square kilometers or more uh, in terms of what I need to analyze. And I just looked at, at well densities on the global map. If I had half a well per square kilometer, that gives me, what, 500 wells, 1,000 wells, whatever. It's a lot of wells to think about. Um, the domain size becomes large. The leakage pathways are very small. And the thing about these wells is that from a modeling point of view, their properties are highly uncertain in the sense that you have a well, you abandoned it 20 years ago, it's highly unlikely that you're going to go out and say, gee, I wonder if that well I abandoned 20 years ago is leaking. I think I'll go, I'll go check it. And if you see leakage, you go measure it, and then you go report yourself so you can assume liability to, to do something with it. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen with individuals. I can tell you it doesn't happen with, uh, with uh, large uh, corporations that, uh, that are in control of wells. So it's very difficult. It's been very difficult for me and my group to get data, um, quantitative measurements of, of any sort of leakage. And that means that these properties become highly uncertain. Now, we're in the process of doing our own in situ measurements uh, in wells that I'll say a few words about towards the end of the talk. But uh, we'll consider these highly uncertain. And we have this small scale, what amounts to geochemistry, of uh, human made material, in this case cement, that could turn out to be critical because this uh, is what we're thinking of as sort of critical leakage pathways. So in this case, the very small geochemistry along the interface, for example, of the cement and the rock can turn out to be critical. So I may need to think about that kind of material degradation into my model. All right, so what to do? Well, we did what any reasonable person would do. We pulled an off-the-shelf code, starting with Tough 2 from, from Lawrence Berkeley. Carson Proust is a terrific code. Um, we've used uh, Eclipse, which is an oil industry code, et cetera. Uh, but you, know, it, you don't need the codes to figure out that uh, if you've got very large domains, with, with important structure in, in, in the vertical, so you've got three-dimensional domains, where the, the important features are these very small uh, uh, line-like features around which you need to have significant numerical grid resolution. Um, that, uh, uh, you know, if you want any reasonable vertical resolution, you know, if, if you want to do a model of how these systems buoyantly separate, it's a very interesting exercise but you get all kinds of complicated flows. You get little vertices that form as, as, uh, as one fluid sort of pushes buoyantly up into the other, et cetera. If you want to, if you want to resolve all of that, um, here I say you need many millions, you probably need many hundreds of millions of grid cells to do a simulation. And that's just, just practically infeasible, especially if we think about this problem from the context of the important properties are highly uncertain. And I have to be thinking about stochastics and probabilistic kinds of analyses. All right, so uh, we decided early on that running a standard simulator was just not feasible. So we did lots of different things. Did upscaling in, in a variety of ways, local refinement with local time stepping. All these things are great fun to do. Um, and we got to write uh, papers about them, which means, of course, they were successful by definition in the academy. Um, but at the end of the day, they didn't really solve our problem. All right, so that's what led us to this last thing, which was to take a step back and simply ask the question, what about this problem is really important, all right? And if we came up with a satisfactory answer to that question, then I decided we would throw away everything else. Right? And that would be the process we would follow to, to do a simplification. So what can we do? Well, first of all, we can observe that if we're interested in leakage, this becomes a risk assessment problem. And the maximum risk of leakage occurs at early time where early time here means during the injection. So it might be 50 years, it might be 70 years, lifetime of a power plant, for example, all right? Um, 
That's where you've got the strongest pressure drive because you're injecting, and it's where you've got the strongest buoyant drive because most of the CO2 is still in a separate buoyant phase. All right? As time goes on, more and more of the CO2 dissolves. The pressure will uh, decay once you stop injecting, and all the driving forces will decrease with time once you stop injecting. So it's the injection period that's most critical. And our argument is that the, the problem inherently has what you might think of as time scale separation. And it's the early time, the injection time, that's most critical from a, from a risk perspective. All right. That means that uh, it's all about two-phase flow physics. Okay? And once we sort of take this, then we say, okay, we're willing to ignore the bulk geochemistry in the rock. Maybe not along the cement, but certainly in the rock. All right? um, we'll ignore non-isothermal effects and various other things to simplify the system. And then we'll take advantage of this strong density difference. We will not worry about the details of how the fluids separate themselves. We'll simply assume that they are separated and we'll make an assumption of a macroscopic sharp interface. All right? Much like we do sometimes in coastal aquifers. Here, as I said, you've got a much stronger uh, drive for this. So we'll do this, and once you make a sharp interface assumption, you always couple it with some assumption about how pressure behaves in the vertical. In this case, we usually use vertical equilibrium, sometimes not, but we always do something with the vertical pressure. If you do that, that set of assumptions, you can solve the resulting set of equations pretty fast numerically. You still have to solve it numerically, but the solutions become pretty fast. All of the numerical codes that we've written in my group use this set of assumptions and therefore solve sharp interface systems for CO2 and brine. My original interest in this was actually to develop analytical solutions for the system. And if you want to get to analytical solutions, you have to make uh, stronger assumptions, as you might imagine. For example, homogeneous horizontal formations. I know you should all laugh at that because uh, uh, for 51 lectures now, everyone has more or less chuckled at this. Uh, I, I will, if anyone wants to have a discussion, I will make an attempt to actually defend it because I think it's not quite so bad. Um, and a few things about Caprock behavior. If you do that, it turns out that you actually can get a set of analytical solutions, which in my opinion are quite useful. And I'll say a few words about them in the next slides. And what we do is after deriving a set of analytical solutions, we will paste those things together to get a semi-analytical solution for the entire injection and leakage system with wells and many layers, as I laid out before. All right, so. <clears throat> this is uh, one of the few slides with mathematics. It's just to prove that we did some mathematics. I'm not going to go through any details, except to say that what we do is in this, we go back to the cartoon I showed you before, and this is what we actually use to solve. All right? We will write a balance equation for the brine, for the two-phase region, and for the CO2 region. Three equations which are coupled, nonlinear, partial differential equations. But they, because of the way the system is behaved, uh, is, is, uh, is constructed, they have certain properties that allow you to define a similarity transformation variable, here denoted by chi, which allows you to transform those three equations into a set of coupled ordinary differential equations with the only independent variable being chi. All right? I'm not going to define these variables, but that's what these things are in dimensionless form. This system you can solve once as a function of chi, and then you have the solution for all values of r and t. So suddenly you have a solution that is quite efficient, actually, to go calculate. Now, uh, this dimensionless group up here, this capital gamma, is a ratio of buoyant drive to viscous drive. All right? And when that ratio is sufficiently small, the system simplifies even further so that we can get an explicit uh, uh, expression for, the the, for this H, which is the thickness of the CO2. It's basically this invading front here, this, this sharp interface, in this very simple uh, expression in dimensionless form. So if you want to make an estimate of how big your plume is going to be at any point in time, for example, it's just uh, this. All right? You want to see where this trailing leg is here? It's this, et cetera. Okay? So you can get very quick and, in my opinion, not unreasonable estimates of what a plume might look like for the CO2. In addition to that, you can get explicit expressions for the pressure perturbation through the entire system, both CO2 and brine. And in this case, here's an example of it, where in the, in the one-phase regions for the brine and the CO2, you get logarithms. And in the two-phase region, you get what amounts to a, an expression which is linear in, in R. But it, you know, those are details. The point is that, is that you can use these, for example, to immediately make an estimate of an area of review, if you know what your delta P threshold is. All right? 
Uh, now, this, uh, this particular uh, solution does not include diffuse leakage, but you can get solutions with diffuse leakage and it looks similar to this, okay? So uh, these solutions by themselves, in my opinion, um, have been enormously helpful, let's, I'll speak for myself, enormously helpful in, 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 in improving my own understanding of how the system behaves. You know, it's very easy to, to, to calculate these and to get a pretty good sense of what's going on and, and to try and ferret out the importance of different kinds of assumptions. But um, we can also take these and put them together to go back to the original problem of leakage estimation. And we do that by thinking about this sort of a, a cartoon sketch here where we've got an injection well with a primary plume and I may get leakage across these uh, sequence of, uh, of caprock formations and that can form secondary plumes and this plume could hit another well and form a tertiary plume and all those sorts of things, all right? We put these solutions together by saying that the mathematics I just showed you, we will use to describe all of these plumes, the injection plume and the secondary plumes, and we'll use the pressure solutions and couple them together in a reasonable way, all right? We couple up in the vertical leakage across these aquitards by writing a straightforward standard two-phase flow Darcy equation. Pressure and density drive the flow. Here's the effective permeability I told you about for all of this stuff outside the casing. And here's a relative permeability for the two-phase flow effects. Every one of these cap rock segments can be described by this vertical Darcy equation uh, uh, across there. And the th that's, that's number two here, leakage dynamics. And the third one, which I won't uh, show any math for, is uh, uh, relatively important if you want to get the flow dynamics, especially the two-phase flow dynamics along leaky wells correct, and that is you have to do something about upconing. In the same way as you get salt water that upcones when you pump uh, a coastal aquifer, when you have leakage, you also get upconing of salt water. In this case, you just don't know what the, what the flow rate is, right? If you know what the pumping rate is, that's what you put in, but in this case, we're trying to figure out what the leakage rate is, but independent of that, if I have leakage, the same dynamics apply, and I have to think about these interfaces that upcone underneath these wells. Uh, and we, again, for this, we, we have a, a different set of analytical solutions, which you can read about in the paper in Water Resources Research. The upshot of all this is that uh, we can do 50 years of simulations on, on domains of a couple thousand square kilometers with a thousand wells and 10 layers, et cetera, in 15 minutes on any laptop computer that's, that's in the room. All right, so that means I have the possibility to do Monte Carlo analyses and all sorts of other things in, in terms of this, of this, uh, of this uh, leakage analysis. So let me show you a quick example. Here is uh, the province of Alberta in Western Canada. The capital of Alberta is Edmonton. Southwest of Edmonton are four large coal-fired power plants emitting collectively about 35 million tons of CO2 per year. And we thought that this would be a place where one might logically expect CCS activity at some point. So uh, with the help of Stefan and his guys, uh, we gathered data for this uh, uh, yellow region, which is, which is uh, 50 kilometers by 50 kilometers. It's 2,500 square kilometers. Here you see the, 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 the 50 by 50 region. Each dot on this region is uh, an existing oil and gas well. So if you add them up quickly, you'll get about 1,250. And if you divide by the area, which is 2,500, you'll get a density of about half a well per square kilometer which was the lowest, the lower bound of the second darkest red on the map I showed you, okay? So um, doesn't seem to be an unreasonable number. You can get uh, stratigraphy with sort of shale, sandstone, shale, sandstone, shale, sandstone, et cetera. If you go a little deeper, you get into carbonates and shales, but nonetheless, you get the sort of layered sequence that you would expect. <coughs> Look at the average slope across this, uh, this domain. It's about half a degree. Um, and uh, during the injection period, you can do some, we, well, we've done some analysis to show that uh, that is not important in terms of giving any significant asymmetry to radial assumptions. So in fact, you can assume it's horizontal and be perfectly reasonable about it. Um, <clears throat> so at the end of the day, um, what we do is we populate this kind of a model with, uh, uh, with data that will take care of all of the formations. So there are a fair amount of data that exist uh, in Alberta. They've got a terrific uh, uh, data system uh, in, in the province. Um, so, uh, so we do that and most of what we do, uh, we will take every formation and treat it deterministically, which is to say we'll assign a single value of permeability, porosity, residual saturation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all of the stochasticity 
comes into the assignment of the effective permeabilities across these cap rocks of the critical leakage pathways, which in this case are the wells. And for that, we need an input distribution. And we've done uh, several different kinds of distributions. <coughs> in some talks, I go through this in some detail. Today, I won't. Um, this is an example of the first one that we used. It's a log normal bimodal distribution where my thinking of this was that I've got good cement, that's this mode, and I've got bad cement, which is this mode, all right? The good cement, I pretty much know, or I thought I knew what the properties were um, because there are lots of measurements of cement that, of course, is cured. You know, if, you, if we did it, if we, if, we, if, we, if we put some cement on the table here and let it set for 30 days or 60 days, we'd get a permeability that's <coughs> some, some fraction of a micro Darcy or something like that, um, very small number. <coughs> what we don't know is what the bad cement or the, 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 the degraded cement looks like. And we've done lots of sensitivity calculations for this. Uh, I'm not going to say much about that, but the point is that we take these and we put these in and drive a sort of Monte Carlo stochastic analysis that gives us distributions as outputs that we can think about in terms of, of leakage profiles and sensitivities. So here's one example. <coughs> On the right here is a, uh, a, a histogram of the fraction of CO2 that's injected after 50 years, that's injected into a layer that leaks into the layer immediately above it. That's the layer in red here, okay? So we inject here for 50 years, and after 50 years, we see how much of the injected CO2 <coughs> shows up in this layer, one, one layer above. And this is the distribution that we see for a particular input of properties across the domain. All right, 10% is a log scale, 1%, et cetera. You see here that on average, we get about half a percent for this set of input, all right? Which for me is a perfectly good answer, in fact. But one of the interesting discussions that has gone on is, um, is, is how to deal with things like confidence intervals and give some idea about, about what a particular number means. Uh, so one of the things that will come up sometimes is to, is to think about, look, instead of just telling me on average it's half a percent, give me something that, no, that, you're, 95, that you're 90 or 95 percent confident about. All right, so tell me that to 90 percent confidence, you won't exceed 1 percent leakage. Okay, that's a possibility. In this case, 25 percent of the time we exceed 1 percent leakage. So under that criterion, we would fail. If that's what we decided to use. My point in, in using this, which is a very trivial uh, uh, example, is to just point out that the way that regulations wind up being written, obviously, have a significant impact on the kind of analysis that we need to do and on how we interpret the results that come out of that analysis. All right. 